Good morning. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to worship at St. John's. I uh, am not Pastor Gillespie. He's on vacation. Uh, I'm Pastor Kristoviak. I'm cer- currently without a parish, and so that means I get to come and do fun stuff like filling in for other pastors when they're out of town or on vacation. It's a pleasure to be with all of you here this morning. Our order of service today is Divine Service Setting 4. Uh, that begins on page 203 in the, bullet, or in the uh, hymnal. Are the screens working? They are working, okay. Uh, so you can either follow along on the screens or uh, with the bulletin and the hymnal in your pew. We begin our service this morning with the hymn of invocation, number 758, The Will of God is Always Best.
we stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness. Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise, and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar. Let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ, and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue with the intro it as printed in the bulletin. We will speak this responsively whole verse by whole verse I will do the odd verses. We will join together to say the Gloria Patri. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, yet I will be confident. One thing have I asked of the Lord, that I will seek to have, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. For he will hide me in the shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid?
Lord be with you. Let us pray. O Lord, grant that the course of this world may be so peaceably ordered by your governance that your church may joyfully serve you in all godly quietness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The Old Testament reading for the fourth Sunday after Trinity is from Genesis chapter 50. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, it may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, Please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin, because they did evil to you. And now, please forgive the transgression of your servants, of the people, of, of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not fear. For am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle is from Romans chapter 8. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We continue with the Alleluia verse. Please stand. You'll find the Alleluia verse printed in the bulletin or on the screens. We will speak this together in unison. Alleluia. 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 You have, you have sat on the throne. Giving righteous judgment. The Lord is a stronghold for the oppressed a stronghold in times of trouble. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the sixth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. He also told them a parable. Can a blind man lead a blind man? Will they not both fall into a pit? A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but not notice the log that is in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, Brother, let me take out the speck that is in your eye, when you yourself do not see the log that is in your own eye? You hypocrite! First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take, the speck that is, to take out the speck that is in your brother's eye. 
This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We continue our worship by confessing our faith. This morning we'll use the Nicene Creed. You'll find that on page 206. Together we confess, I believe in one God, Please be seated. We continue with the hymn of the day.
grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. One of the benefits of preaching at various churches to help out during times of vacation or vacancy is that sometimes you show up to church and you look at the lectionary book and it says one year lectionary and you realize that you had prepared to preach on the appointed text for the three year lectionary. Let me read that text to you this morning. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him and he was beside the sea Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at Jesus' feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come, lay your hands on her, so that she may be made well and live. And Jesus went with him. And a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. And there was a woman who had had a discharge of blood for twelve years, and who had suffered much under many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus, and came up behind him in the crowd, and touched his garment. For she said, If I touch even his garments, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing about you, and yet you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion, people wailing and weeping loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, Why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kumi, which means, little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking. And they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. This is our text. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, Alberto Salazar and his brothers always used to play in a large pond behind their house in suburban Connecticut. One year, on his birthday, they heard sirens and saw several fire trucks and ambulances speed down the road. So Alberto ran to the pond and climbed a tree to see what the commotion was all about. And what he saw left a lasting impression on him his whole life long. Several boys right about his age had been playing out on the water on a makeshift raft, and one boy had fallen in and drowned. The scene made a great impression on Alberto. That night he prayed for the first time what would become a constant prayer in his life. When I die, don't let me be afraid. Bring me straight to heaven to your son, Jesus. Amen. It turned out that this prayer would be needful for Alberto. Throughout his entire life, he had many, many close calls with death. He immigrated to the United States from Cuba when he was 18 months old and shortly after caught scarlet fever. It looked like he wouldn't survive, but somehow he pulled through. As a young man, he was running in the Falmouth Road Race on Cape Cod. It's held every year in August, and this particular year it was very hot. 
About halfway through the race, he started feeling strange, and the next thing he remembered, he was in the medical tent, hearing numbers call out, called out as he lay in a tub of ice water. 103, 104, 105. He also heard hushed whispers of severe brain damage, and we might lose him. He had suffered a severe heat stroke while running, but somehow he pulled through. By evening, he was released from the hospital, the only lasting effects a few bruises from where the IVs had been placed. Finally, at the age of 48, Alberto suffered a cardiac event. He's one of the last people in the world that you would suspect would suffer from heart disease. See, Alberto Salazar was an Olympic distance runner, a three-time winner of the New York Marathon, a former world record holder in the marathon. His heart would be rock solid, you would think. But one June day, Alberto would set another unofficial world record. While coaching several young runners, he collapsed. His heart stopped beating, and it wouldn't start again for 14 minutes. By all accounts, he should have died that day. And yet somehow he survived. Miraculously, he survived and credits God along with being in the right place at the right time with his survival. A book was written all about it. It's called 14 Minutes, A Running Legend's Life and Death and Life. On the cover, there's a quote of endorsement. 14 Minutes is an inspirational account of a man who fought the Grim Reaper and won. Alberto's story is quite remarkable, and I very much enjoyed reading it. Many times he came close to the edge of life and death, and he gives appropriate credit to God who sustained him. But I'm not sure I would call him a man who fought the Grim Reaper and won. 14 Minutes isn't a book about such a man, but I know a book that is. The Grim Reaper is often the name we give to death. It is death personified. It's scary, horrifying. In our gospel lesson this morning, we hear the story of the man who fought the Grim Reaper, who fought with death and won. We come to the story with Jesus and his disciples and a great crowd and a ruler of the synagogue, Jairus, coming to Jesus at his wit's end. His daughter is dead sick and not just a little sick she's at the point of death she teeters on the edge between life and death and Jairus knows that he is facing down the tragedy of a lifetime something he may never get over and so he comes to Jesus without doubt Jairus had heard the the rumors and the tales of this Jesus who was a a man from God, strong in word and deed, and miraculous power resided in him. And so he comes and falls before Jesus. Nothing else would help. My daughter, my little daughter, is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. And Mark tells us that there's no deliberation there's no questioning of Jesus. He simply goes with her. This is why he came to overcome sin and death for Jairus and his little daughter. And so immediately he goes. But Jesus couldn't go anywhere without a crowd. And there's a delay, a costly delay. And when one is at the point of death, delay, or even a small one, can be catastrophic. And so Jesus is prevented from going immediately to Jairus' daughter, and by the time he shows up, she's been dead. She's dead. In fact, she's been dead perhaps for some time. There are people gathered about, weeping and wailing loudly. There's a commotion outside the house. Word has gotten out, not just to Jairus, but to the community. And they've done what communities do. They've gathered about trying to help. In Jesus' day, it was not uncommon when somebody died for a, a group to, to assemble simply for the purpose of weeping and wailing, grieving publicly on behalf of the person 
who's lost somebody. But Jesus wouldn't be dissuaded. For him, the death of this little girl is but sleep, and he can wake her with a small shaking of the shoulder. So that's what he does. He takes with him Peter and James and John, and he goes into the girl, and he wakes her up. Talitha kumi, little girl, I say to you, arise. And like that, he fights the grim reaper, and he wins. And everyone's amazed. Well, this isn't the only time Jesus fought the grim reaper and won. In fact, it seems that whenever he came upon a scene like the one in, in our gospel lesson today in Mark chapter 6, he can't help himself. In Luke chapter 7, he's coming to a town called Nain, and he sees a funeral procession. A woman's son has died, and she's a widow, and this is her only son. And he ruins that funeral. He stops the procession. He puts his hand onto the coffin, and instead of the uncleanness of that dead body flowing into Jesus and making him unclean, instead his life flows out of himself and into that, that young man. And he's risen from the dead. And the woman's life is restored. In John chapter 11, Jesus is called to a town of Bethany, a short, a suburb of Jerusalem, if you will. His friend Lazarus has died. And Jesus delays, again delayed in coming to Bethany. And he only gets there four days after Lazarus has died. And in Jesus' time in, in uh, popular thought, four days meant that Lazarus was really, really dead. There was some thought that for three days the soul would hover over the body and after three days it would depart to heaven. So by pointing out that Lazarus was dead four days, he was dead as a doornail, we're sure he's dead, he's not just sleeping heavily, he's not just breathing in a very shallow way that we can't tell, but he's dead in the tomb, the stone rolled in front of it. And Jesus tells them not to be afraid, not to weep and wail and mourn, but to simply believe that he is the resurrection and the life. And he calls Lazarus out of the tomb, and Lazarus is alive. New Testament legend surrounding this story tells us that Lazarus was not just raised to life, but he was restored because church legend, I suppose you might say, has it that Lazarus was a disabled man, and Mary and Martha, his sisters, took care of him. But when Jesus healed Lazarus, he didn't just raise him from the dead, he healed him and restored his body. Finally, Jesus himself faces down death. We confess the story here every Sunday, or you confess it here, and in churches all throughout the world. He was crucified, died, and he was buried. He descended into hell. But you know that the story doesn't end here because Jesus is the one who fights the grim reaper and wins. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. Jesus faces down the grim reaper and wins, not just for Jairus' daughter, not just for the, the widow's son at Nain, not just for Lazarus, not for himself, but for you. And it makes all the difference in the world for you and for me. Jesus is the man God sent to defeat death. He didn't just die and rise again to conquer his own death, but to conquer yours and to conquer mine. His numerous resurrection miracles show us this. And this means that we no longer have to live in fear of our death. The grim reaper is no longer one to be feared. To be sure, death is the ultimate and universal enemy of mankind. It is the veil that is cast over all people. As David says in that famous psalm, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. We all walk in death's dark valley. The only difference is that we don't walk through it alone. We don't walk through it on our own, afraid of what will come next, but instead we walk with the one who has defeated death. And we, so we can walk in confidence, knowing now that death stands null and void. It has no power over us. 
Jesus has defeated death. He defeated it for Jairus' daughter, for the widow's son at Nain, for Lazarus, and for you. Your death stands defeated. You now no longer need to fear it. In fact, we often sing and refer to death as sleep. And contrary to what our small children might think, sleep isn't a very scary thing. In fact, at the end of a long day, it's quite welcome. And so we no longer have to fear death. It's defeated once and for all by Jesus in his cross and resurrection. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord to life everlasting. Amen. We continue with the prayer of the church. Please stand. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. O Lord, our light and our salvation, you are our strength. Work in us a worthy fear and constant trust in your mercy that we would fear nothing else in this passing world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As your mercy is poured out in rich measure, so open the mouths of all ministers in the church to preach your blessed and saving gospel. Open the mouths of Christians to proclaim the marvels of him who called us from darkness into his marvelous light. And let our works of mercy attest to the love we have received from you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, teach all your children true humility, that we would learn to confess our sin rather than excusing or denying it, Keep us safe from all pride, which would lead us to disdain our fellow Christians who have received your mercy. Rather, make us rejoice at your patience, which you have shown to us all in forgiving our many trespasses. Lord, in your mercy. Lord of all, you raised up Joseph according to your plan to exercise authority in Egypt, working good from what was meant only for evil. Work by your power in the leaders and authorities of our nation, that you, whom you have set in place, that many would be kept alive and protected in this life through their governance. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Receive the groanings of your church, dear Father, as we await the redemption of our bodies and the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Turn away the corruption of sin the futility of our fallen state, and every evil of body and soul. Comfort us in the midst of these sufferings with the certain hope of your incomparable glory, which at last will re be revealed in us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful Father, clear away all grudges, unbelief, and impenitence from us, that we may eat and drink your Son's body and blood, with lively faith in his promises, and receive the forgiveness you give in this blessed sacrament. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, you are merciful, and through Christ you promised that you will neither judge us nor condemn us, but graciously forgive all our sins and abundantly provide for all our wants of body and soul. By your Holy Spirit, establish in our hearts a confident faith in your mercy. Teach us in turn to be merciful to our neighbor, that we may not judge or condemn others, but willingly forgive all, and judging only ourselves, lead blessed lives in your fear. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Everlasting God, for the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us in all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin, giving him into death that we might not die eternally. Because he is now risen from the dead, and lives and reigns to all eternity. All who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of all creation, for you have had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. In your righteous judgment, you condemned the sin of Adam and Eve, who ate the forbidden fruit, and you justly barred them and all their children from the tree of life. Yet in your great mercy, you promised salvation by a second Adam, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and made his cross a life-giving tree for all who trust in him. We give you thanks for the redemption you have prepared for us through Jesus Christ. Grant us your Holy Spirit that we may faithfully eat and drink of the fruits of his cross and receive the blessings of forgiveness, life, and salvation that come to us in his body and blood. Hear us as we pray in his name and as he has taught us. Our Father, Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Amen.
we stand? Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us in the same, through the same, in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.